I'm Craig Kenneth, a relationship coach and a psychotherapist. Every relationship is different and every breakup is different. Work with me and you'll get professional help on your situation. And if you're in no contact, focused on personal growth, my workbook series, The Knowledge, will help you make changes like you've never made before. Available now at AskCraig.net. Hi there, I'm Coach Craig Kenneth. I'm Coach Margaret. And today we're going to be talking about the suds. The suds? Yeah, you know the thing that SpongeBob gets when he's sick? Oh, poor SpongeBob, yes. <laughs> his, all of his little holes get bubbles in them. That's right, it's awful. And we thought it's really important to talk about this because, quite frankly, SpongeBob is amazing. SpongeBob is amazing. <laughs> and, you know, after a hard day of listening to, to troubles and difficulties, sometimes SpongeBob is just what you need when you get home. That's true. Some of Patrick's wisdom is just, you know... People are very confused right now. We're, we're not talking about the suds which SpongeBob gets. We're going to get to that in a minute, though. But first, Margaret has a success story that she got emailed to her All today. Right. And it was just a short one. Just a short story. And then we're going to talk about what are the suds. I think I've had them. I think I do, too. I think you had them in the last couple of weeks also. All right. Um, I got a, a delightful um, missive today from someone, and I'll just call it success story. A woman contacted me for a second session mm -hmm. we had talked about three months ago and wrote the following. This was the funny part. After three months of obsessively watching your videos, soul searching, seeking therapy, and improving myself overall, I got my ex back. Yes. But a she, success story. But she makes it sound like she worked really hard, doesn't she? She sure did. I think she did, yes. I'm very proud of her and pleased for her. Um, it has been wonderful thus far, but I knew all along that getting back together doesn't automatically mean living happily ever after. I wanted him back to get another shot at making this relationship work, and I know that apart from the work I've already done on my own, we will now need to work together at overcoming past challenges. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do couples achieve true forgiveness in order to move forward with a clean slate? That's a great question. Isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a great, great question. How do we make sure that past hurts don't come back to haunt us and derail any work we put into this rena renewed relationship? Do you want to answer that? I can answer that. Well, you go ahead and answer right. that first. Because um, you I, have a lot better understanding of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, what I said to her is that you have to talk totally openly about whatever topics you'd be concerned about. I think they're talking about things they did to each other during the last breakup. Mm -hmm. um, but those things need to be talked about and they need to be talked about thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, she did some things and in fact she she was just coming to terms with some anger that she has carried for very many good and understandable reasons for many years mm -hmm. that her boyfriend had had some problems with her anger they can talk about that he had had a difficult time I think really believing that she loves him and they can talk about that at some length she mm -hmm. had some concern however I think maybe it was the boyfriend's concern can you overdo talking about things no I don't think you can. Can you? Well, I wouldn't say you could overdo it, right. but I think you might be able to um, overwhelm somebody. Yeah, or yeah, or overdo it and pepper them with questions. Don't uh, you think we should talk about that again? I, I yeah. if somebody, you got to be able to read if somebody wants to talk about it yes. or not. It's it can be communicated as much as it needs to be right. but if somebody needs some space or a break from it right. then you have to allow that yeah you don't want to persist when and, it's no and particularly if you're anxious and the other person is not that you may have an anxiety attack and be concerned about something that you've already processed and you don't want to beat the person to death with it mm -hmm. uh, but if it comes up again then of course you go back to it yeah um, and I certainly wouldn't want to overwhelm somebody uh, right as things started to get back together yeah. because that might just right. make them say like this is too much I can't get back I into can't this. do this yeah 
So I would certainly take my time and I wouldn't be pushing to talk about things other than, you know, maybe here and there as it needs to. Yeah. And, and you certainly don't want to be after someone who's not used to talking about feelings going, oh no, you want to talk about feelings again? Well, that's exactly what I was about to get to is <laughs> yeah. if, if the person is avoidant, you don't want the avoidant person to feel um, overwhelmed by right. talking about it. Now, um, if you were the avoidant one in the relationship and they're trying to talk with you, um, it's probably better to allow that communication. Right. But if they're more avoidant, then you need to give them a little bit more space and not push them That's right. into talking So about again, it. you have to gauge your partner's readiness and willingness and openness. But yeah. I am very happy for them. And what? I absolutely hope they make it. What are your thoughts about forgiveness? Well, um, forgiveness I think is tricky and there's an awful lot of sort of popular wisdom out there about how the wronged party has to forgive the person who wronged them in order for them to be okay. And I have an enormous problem with that. If I'm mugged by somebody on the street who comes up behind me and hits me on the head and takes my purse before I have a chance to hit him with it, um, I'm not going to be real happy with him. And for me to get over that trauma and being startled and frightened and injured and all of that, um, it's going to take me a while, and I might have, might have some post-traumatic stress to that. Am I supposed to be obligated to somehow forgive him to make myself feel better? No. I'm not happy that he hit me over the head. Now, if I'm a reasonable person, um, after I get over my rage that this happened to me and that he did this to me, I'm going to remember that he's a worthwhile human being and probably not spend the rest of my life wanting to stone him to death. Mm -hmm. But there are many arguments out there. The most prominent one, which has annoyed me the most, is that the victim of sexual abuse is somehow obligated to forgive the perpetrator. Absolutely not. There are some things that are unforgivable. Some things, you know, leave people with post-traumatic stress and trauma and scars for a lifetime. Now, it depends on what you mean by forgive. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend my life again thinking about how nice it would be to stone the guy to death. But I'm also going to say, that's okay, and I want to welcome you back into my life. I'm not going to say that either. And oftentimes in families, victims have been pressured um, to forgive a perpetrator for the sake of keeping the family together. And I think it's not fair, and I think it's to disrespect the victim's experience. Yeah, I had somebody, I think last week, tell me that they were taken advantage of, abused by the uncle, yeah. and then they said, nope, didn't happen to you just so the uncle could stay part of the family. Absolutely outrageous. And a, compl and a second violation of her truth and her experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not okay. Um, now there are people who, you know, and again, this gets difficult. There are people who will tell me that they have forgiven a family member, that they've totally worked through it and so forth and so on. But if I see them more than a couple of months, I, found, I find out that they still have post-traumatic stress disorder. So no, it's not done. No, you're not finished processing it. And there's probably some unprocessed anger still there. I found that a lot of people are, I think, too willing to forgive parents. Too willing to forgive parents, yes, because it's always extremely upsetting and anxiety provoking to be angry at parents but we have to deal with reality. Mm -hmm. um, for example, let's say you had a dad that, you know, had mom cheated on dad, dad decides he's leaving. Well, I know somebody that dad walked away from the family and abandoned the daughter to go start this new life with a new family and abandoned his old family, his old kids, because he was so angry at uh, the wife for cheating on him. But the daughter is not 
angry and still idealize his dad and forgives him. That's a problem, yeah. Because you can't, you certainly can't forgive somebody until you deal with your anger at them. But to skip the anger stage and go right to I forgive you spares you the struggle and the pain and the growth, I might also add, of having to deal with your real feelings around it. I mean, we can be angry at the people we love, otherwise nobody would stay in any relationship for more than 20 minutes. Um, but there are some huge things. Abandoning a family, abandoning a child is not okay ever, and it never will be. Mm -hmm. And whether she realizes it or not, realizes it or not, she's angry and she will have to deal with it. And it will come out in all kinds of different ways. Eventually, unprocessed anger of that magnitude will come out in either anxiety symptoms or symptoms of depression that may not have an obvious cause. Can you talk about that more? That does happen. Um, I will have all kinds of people come to see me and I have anxiety suddenly for no reason at all or I just had a, a depression for absolutely no reason at all. Were there no precipitants? No, I think it was a lot of different things. It's always a lot of different things, but there's always one thing that presses, you know, that broke the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. There's always the one straw. There's always a fairly immediate precipitant. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to look at it, oftentimes what you find out one of the most common things I found out working in um, public mental health clinics is that um, women of all ages from 30 on would come in talking about the sudden onset of anxiety symptoms. Never had anxiety symptoms before in my life and now I'm having them. Mm -hmm. I have panic attacks, blah, 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 blah. And what I found out after years, not because I found it in a book, was that it was the beginning of remembering a trauma history. A sexual abuse. A sexual abuse history. And what comes up first is the feeling, the anxiety, followed eventually by either a dream or a flashback of some of the scenes mm -hmm. so that the actual memory comes back. I've, I've had a couple of men as well. But that's a very common issue. And people can have um, depressions that appear to have no um, precipitant and they just suddenly have come. And one of the things I've learned about that is it's oftentimes an unmourned loss. Um, you may have had a death in the family, a death when you were a kid that nobody knew you were upset about, etc. And oftentimes if you can find the loss and, and help the person deal with it, um, that will take care of things. I had a woman who had been diagnosed bipolar no less because she had crazy mood swings and she'd be okay for part of the year and not okay for the other part of the year. And finally I said to her, let's look at the anniversaries of the losses in your life. And sure enough, she had had two sets of step parents, loved all of them and had lost all of them um, shortly before losing her husband. And what was happening to her was she was trying to mourn all these losses at once. Um, and they would come up at different times of year. So she'd be okay for a month, then would come another month with an anniversary in it. And sure enough, the depression would be back. Wow. And once we were able to make a calendar of her anniversaries, and she knew what the problem was, she did a hundred times better. Because she knew what was going on. She knew on. what was happening, yeah. Um, so there are, there are things that you learn in time. But there's no appearance of a symptom for no reason at all. Yep. Um, I'm convinced. Um, Absolutely. And people will swear up and down, you know. Um, or with the anxiety attacks, what's in your head when you have the anxiety attack? Nothing. One of the things I've learned to do, but not everyone will do it, is write down everything they can remember for 24 hours before they had the anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. And if you have the patience to do that, and you can do it a couple of times, you can usually find out who or what you were thinking about that did it to you. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of work to do it and a lot of patience. Wow. Yeah. Now, we were talking earlier about the suds. The suds. And yes. so, <laughs> let's explain what the suds are. And I think it is helpful because of what we just discussed. You can kind of incorporate it yeah. into what that is. Margaret is going to share what the suds are. It I stands for something. Yes. 
Um, I looked it up the other day because it came into my head as a possibly useful tool for people. And SUDS stands for Subjective Unit of, di of Distress. Subjective a unit, unit of, of distress. distress. Like, how do I feel at this moment? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at a different level, the different level of distress. And so this will help you if you're going to look at where you're at in the mm -hmm. breakup and how distressing it might be for you. Right. Okay, so there's 10. Okay. So, of course, as soon as I started dealing with the suds, I remembered that Spongebob often gets the, the suds. And poor Spongebob is really sick when he has them. Um, little bubbles come out of his head and, and his eyes move around in his head. He has a terrible time. So I don't want you to catch the suds, but I want you to use this if it's useful. It's basically a fancy how do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10 about whatever. Okay? Yeah. How's your anxiety today on a scale from 1 to 10? All right, the number one said, you will, one said if we look at that, you're feeling pretty good. Nothing big is going on, all right? Number two, how about two units of distress? You're slightly annoyed. You will notice that something is bothering you. Mm -hmm. You may not be sure what, and it may not interfere with your day too much, but you notice that something is bothering you. Mm -hmm. Three suds, you're mildly bothered, upset or worried. Mm -hmm. about something that may kind of be vague but you're you're uncomfortable you're upset you worried four suds slightly upset a feeling you can't ignore I'm bothered by something today you feel okay but you're not happy uh, somehow this day isn't flowing right you know can't focus on what I'm doing five suds upset and bothered you can manage but the issue is front and center in your mind. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So I can't stop thinking about whatever. Yeah. And that's a five. That's a five. Six. You have emotions that you feel you can't ignore and that they need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I keep feeling angry. I keep feeling sad. I keep feeling anxious. Anxious would be the most common one. What's making me feel anxious? Mm -hmm. All right? Am I thinking of my lost love, or what am I thinking of? Um, seven. Seven says, that's a lot of says. You are upset, angry, or anxious, feeling bad, and concerned about keeping in control. Mm -hmm. In other words, you'd have trouble going on with your day. If you were at work, it would be hard to continue with your day. You're feeling pretty out of sorts. Okay. Eight says, very upset may even feel physically ill. Wow. You know, now some yeah. people can get physically ill, their stomach can feel upset, they get a headache, right? Digestive problems. Digestive problems are very common, mm -hmm. yeah. And very linked with anxiety. Very linked with anxiety, yep. Messes with your whole sure. system. So at that point, you would need to do what you do to calm down. And I'm sure everyone remembers the first thing to do to calm down, which is breathe deeply. That's Mother Nature's calm down mechanism, okay? The other quick thing you can do is remind yourself that you're okay, you're here, you're breathing, you're thinking, and you're all right for the moment. You're not in total crisis, mm -hmm. all right? Nine suds, extremely upset, scared of losing control of your emotions and your feelings are unbearable. Mm -hmm. It's like I can't stay at work anymore, I have to leave, I have to go home, I have to talk to somebody, I have to do something. Yeah. And that's pretty bad. That's when it's really interfering with your functioning. Yeah. Okay. And 10 is a whole ton of suds. That's feeling out of control and overwhelmed with your thoughts. And you're having extremely intense feelings. Which... You certainly couldn't stay at work under those circumstances. Yeah. You'd have to go try and do something that would help yourself. Breathe, reorient yourself, call someone you can talk to. Yep. Okay. And I would say... Um, the distress that you're feeling over a breakup is often in the upper oh, yeah. scale. Uh, absolutely. You know, where you can't six focus, through ten. you can't concentrate, right? I think it's pretty common to yep. feel like a six through a ten yep. for months. Right. For many for months, months. For months. It's and normal. it's normal. And that's the important thing to remember. It's normal. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was uh, a very helpful scale for you guys. And you should go back and listen to it. and. Think about where you're at on the scale. Maybe it'll help you 
identify what you're going through and what's going on in your day. It can also help you um, notice progress. Yeah. You know, when I did this last Tuesday, say I'm going to do this every Tuesday to see how I'm doing, I was at an 8 and today I'm at a 5, so no. I've made progress, I can measure it, I can see it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can put things on here that you like yourself. So it's kind of a fancy, how do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10. But it's helpful. It is helpful, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, hopefully you enjoyed this video, we, we talked about a lot of different things. Uh, you know, we talked about forgiveness. Yeah. We talked, we shared a success story and then we talked about the suds. Give Margaret a like on the video because she did a lot of work and research on this one. And of course, when you want to get our help personally, just go to my website, AskCraig.net. Sign up for the coaching option that works best for you. I do email coaching and I do Skype. Margaret is also available for Skype coaching. I'm available for Skype coaching a little faster than I used to be. I can probably get you in within a week now. That's right. Okay, and Just, if you get the suds, by all means, call us. That's right. Margaret can definitely help with the suds. Click on Margaret on the top of the website and be sure to subscribe to the channel. That's it for this video. I'm Coach Craig Kenneth. I'm Coach Margaret. And we will talk with you soon.